it's such a pleasure to be here. I, I reread the article that Kenneth Schwartz wrote for the Boston Globe in 1995. Um, I'm in awe of what has come from his decision in the mid-90s, the Schwartz Center. It's, it's really quite something, and everyone should be proud of the work that's done. Um, I've been asked to say a couple of words about compassionate care, and I'm going to, but first I'm going to preface with some words about not-so-compassionate care. Um, listeners to here and now might have heard several years ago, 2005 actually, I would share some of the stories of caring for my mom. And we had some of the strangest experiences. Once when she was in the hospital, we're all gathered in the hall trying to figure something out. A lot of people in the hall outside the patients' rooms trying to figure things out. And a nurse came running down the hall and she said, quick, quick, get against the wall, get against the wall. And we all flattened against the wall. I thought, oh my God, something, maybe a gurney with some terrible thing. Or we're all flat against the wall. And down the hall came this doctor with his white coat flapping and he was carrying on, holding court with another doctor, walking down the hall, very imperious. And he passed by, and we're all looking like, What's, what were we against the wall for? And the nurse came out so apologetic. She said, I'm so sorry. He can't stand to have people around him when he walks down the hall. <laughs> it was that the doctor didn't want to be soiled by any of us, the families of the patients. That struck a note uh, with me. Um, my mom took a terrible fall. She was in an emergency room. It was just awful. She had a gash that actually, it, 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 it actually was um, what killed her. And we all rushed down, and she was on a gurney with uh, her caregiver um, in the hall waiting for us to come, completely disoriented. And we arrived in the emergency room, and some of the workers in the emergency room were playing basketball against the wall that her gurney was against. I thought I would lose it. And I've talked about these, as I said, on the air. We didn't have a very good experience. Um, however, she had a caregiver, a woman named Akushia, who was from Ghana, who was the most extraordinary individual. She was still in her home, but Akushia would, was there around the clock, exhausted, because she was staying up with her at night. This woman, you talk about compassionate care. It was just stunning. And I did get to see it more recently. And it's a story that I think can maybe erase partly the experience that I had in New York. After the Boston bombings, I was privileged to be able to go into our hospitals. I mean, there was a complete lockdown at these hospitals, at, as at least one of our speakers knows. And I was so privileged to be invited by um, some of the bomb victims to come in. And I got to see what our hospitals did. I mean, it was breathtaking. I would be waiting in the hall, you know, to speak to Adrian Haslett, the dancer who lost her leg, or Jeff Bowman, or some of the other um, victims of the bombing. And I would see nurses go and huddle in closets and just bawl, you know, and then go back in and walk in and do their jobs. And this was just as shattering for them as being on the front lines of a war. And I've just never been so proud and never seen so much compassion as being able to witness some of what our hospitals did in the wake of the bombings. So a lot of people know how to do it. A lot of people know of the words that I read Kenneth Schwartz write in 1995. I, when I was reading this again, I thought that's what I got to see in those days after the bombing. Ex the ordeal that he went through and the ordeal of these patients was punctuated by moments of exquisite compassion he said he was the re recipient of an extraordinary array of human and humane responses, acts of kindness, the simple human touch from his caregivers that made the unbearable bearable. I think this is what this is all about, you know, making the unbearable bearable. So I applaud you all, first of all, and applaud yourselves for being a part of and being interested in doing that. Thank you. So I thought what I would do is start today's story is as a physician who became a patient and taking over two years to recover from being hit by a car in a crosswalk with a green light that said walk. Um, and what I learned in that two year plus journey is that compassion is not those big moments, but it's the little moments. It's the inflection, it's the voice, it's the phrase, you know? It may not be the total package, but that is the moment where compassion happens. 
So, you know me, an emergency physician, I've uh, been, uh, you know, active about boarding, you know, for years, if some of you who know me. So uh, this fortunately was not in Boston, but as I was crossing the street, went to the level one trauma center, spent 15 hours boarded in the emergency department waiting for a bed to open up. When the admitting team, after a CT this, CT that, CT scan and everything else, the admitting team, you know, where I hadn't quite left the emergency department, came by and said, well, we've re-looked at all of your scans and all of your studies and nothing is broken, you can go home. And I went, oh. You know, um, I haven't walked since the accident. I don't even know if I can walk. And by the way, I'm on business. I'm staying in a hotel. I don't have anything. But, but being the doctor, and I never told them I was a doctor. I just wanted to be a patient. I said, okay, I'm going to be a really good patient. No question. Of course, if you think I can go home, I I'm going to go home. Um, just get someone to see if they can help me up. And sure enough, they tried to stand me up, you know, to ground. You know, there's no way I could go. And the team came back in, and I'll never forget come into my, by my gurney bedside with the hand on, on his hip, said, well, there's no real reason to admit you, but I guess if you can't walk, we'll just have to admit you. <laughs> and here I am, a physician, an emergency, I mean, this is my, these are my colleagues, right? And my first reaction was, you know, I failed. I failed the test. Like, what's wrong with me? It's my fault. I shouldn't have never been in, what am I, a wimp, you know? Um, and that was the start of my journey through the hospital, okay? Think of the opportunity of what could have been said. That's in sharp contrast, a little shout out to Braintree Rehab Hospital where I was eventually transferred, you know, by airplane into the Braintree Rehab, a real shout out to them. Because in sharp contrast, the first thing they asked is, what is important to you? What do you want? I just want to learn to walk the stairs so that I can go up the stairs so I can use a bathroom like for real, you know, um, <laughs> and go home. Um, but it was also they knew how to maintain dignity. They knew those little personal moments. So I was in a semi-private. There was an 80-some-year-old lady who had just been transferred from another hospital. And uh, it was now nighttime. And all the laxatives she had been given at the other hospital started working, like really working, all night long, all through the entire night shift. The nurse was in and out. And you can imagine, if you're an awake alert, how embarrassing and how difficult, and I never saw those nurses take away her dignity. It was never her fault. It was, I mean, and they were really literally up to their elbows, and, and they just treated her like such a woman um, who, um, you know, do not worry, this is what we do. And, not, and in the middle of all this, they had the time to come over to me and say, we're really sorry, I'm sorry you're up all night, really, if, is there anything we can do for you? Those were those little moments. Now, as patients, we have the right to expect that, and we should. But I also wanted to share to you, because I'm a physician, that as hard as it is to be a patient and expect that compassionate care, it is as difficult for the physician and the clinicians to, have to deliver compassionate care. So I go back to my emergency department days, and um, working in the emergency department, you know, doors fly open, cardiac arrest comes in, guy comes in, you know, barely sustainable heart rate, you know, and you get to work, you know, and your juices are all running, you know, and, and I, I hear the wife is here and she wants to talk. Okay, you know, you step away, you know, go to the wife, and she says, you know, and she hands me a shaking hands, you know, it's my husband, he has this advanced directive, he doesn't really want anything heroic done, so I'm going, okay, I get it, get, you know, we're not, you know. And then she goes on to say, but you know, he just collapsed at home and I didn't know what to do, so I started CPR. And I went, oh my goodness, you know? And there was that moment, like I had a choice, right? I could be the clinical expert telling you, okay, don't do, um, you know, we're gonna stop everything, he's got an advanced directive, you know, let's, let's just withdraw and pull everything. But I also saw a woman who doubt, now didn't know, should she be guilty that she did CPR? Did she do the right thing? And this is her husband, after all, and she was a normal person. You see someone collapse, what do you do? You start CPR, right? So I had to flip and become a person and say, what do you, your husband want? And you know what? Anybody in that condition, you know, in your situation would have done what you did. Now let's talk about what your husband wants. And we had a few moments to talk, and she didn't want any, you know, he didn't want heroics. And I said, she said, what do I do? And as a physician, I, I mean, I'm sitting on on the cusp of life and death. I'm sitting on the cusp of we do everything. We could make him live and get to the, to the ICU or I can let go for somebody I don't even know. I just met her. 
we had that conversation and I said, you know, here's what will happen, et cetera. And the final decision was to let him go because we did have the advanced directive. And then she said, but my children, all five of my kids are in the area. What am I going to say? What am I going to do? And I said, you know, I know this is a busy emergency department. It's really crazy. We're going to keep working. You call your family and you bring your children here. And she called and all five children gathered around. So they had the chance to hold his hand, to say goodbye, to not feel the guilt, to feel like life um, it was not unfinished. And they had closure in the crazy, crazy place of the emergency department. We're not scripted for this. If you had asked me before this happened, would I have done that? Absolutely not. So what I've learned is, as a patient, you do need to speak up. You know, Don't try and be the good patient. Be the person who says, here's what I need, here's what I want, here's what I want from you, here's what's important to me. But as a clinician, as a physician, we also need to have that opportunity, have that radar, that we see that moment where we convert from being the clinical expert and saying, here's you know, the, the chemotherapy and the management and the this and that, to take that moment to virtually, physically, or however, hold the hand so that whatever happens, it is bearable, as Robin said, that whatever happens, there is no guilt, and whatever happens, there's closure. Um, this is my personal story, a uh, patient experience that I had, and it was 10 years ago on a Friday afternoon in March that I ended up in the emergency room at the Brigham. Um, I had unbearable abdominal pain. I couldn't stand up. I was really in trouble, and uh, my husband and I both knew that I was in trouble, and unfortunately, we were not strangers to Sharon being sick. Um, I had had three years previous to that breast cancer and had recovered successfully. And three years before that, I had had a very tough appendicitis with peritonitis and an allergy to almost every uh, antibiotic that you can imagine. So I had been very, very sick and had been in the hospital for a long time. So our entire family were veterans of the hospital wars. Um, we were familiar with CAT scans and MRIs and emergency rooms and ORs, and um, it had been traumatizing. So on this day, we went into the emergency room and we had, I had all sorts of scans. And several hours later, the uh, doctors came to me and said, came to me and my husband and said, we don't exactly know what it is, but you have a large ovarian mass and you're gonna need surgery. Um, but you need to see your gynecologist on Monday. We really can't do anything more for you now. So they made an appointment for me to see my gynecologist on Monday morning. We went home and sat through a torturous weekend, as you can imagine, thinking the worst. Um, trying to play Scrabble and go to a movie, but it really it didn't work. Um, so we went to see Dr. Jerry Federschneider, who's my gynecologist, on Monday morning. He practices in Brookline, and he's at the Brigham. And the first thing he did, he had reviewed all of my tests and had carefully looked at everything. And the first thing he did was he said to me, I've looked at everything. I don't really know exactly what you have going on, and we won't know until we operate but I don't think you have ovarian cancer. And with that, he excused himself, and he went out to the waiting room because he wanted to tell my husband that. He didn't want Brian to sit there for an hour while he went through my exam with me thinking the worst, so he gave him some relief. So already you know what kind of a person this is. So my surgery was two days later, and I had a hysterectomy. It was a very difficult operation. Um, it was a tough recovery from the very beginning. But um, I did fairly well. I was in the hospital for four or five days and then was discharged and sent home. And as soon as I got home, things started to unravel. I, I wasn't doing well. Um, I had some troubling symptoms. And because of my experience when I had my appendectomy several years earlier, I knew that I was an adhesion former. Um, I was somebody who just did that after surgery. So when it got to the point that it was very scary, we um, had talked to Dr. Federschneider on the phone several times. And um, he doesn't know this, but he's affectionately nicknamed the Schneid by my family. So um, we had talked to the Schneid several times, and he finally said, you know what, you need to come back to the emergency room. You need to get in. So we went back to the emergency room, and uh, it was late afternoon when we got there. And uh, immediately it was clear that I needed a nasogastric tube inserted. I don't know how many of you have experience with nasogastric tubes, or NG tubes, as we fondly call them. but they're nasty little things. Um, and the insertion of an NG tube is a very unpleasant uh, experience. So the resident was getting ready to insert the NG tube because that was his job. And Dr. Federschneider came in and he took my hand and he said, 
I'm going to do this insertion for you. So um, for him to do that for me, something that a resident should certainly have been doing, just meant the world to me. It just it gave me comfort to know that he was going to see me through this. So we got the NG tube in, we did a bunch of scans, and um, the worst fear was realized I did have an intestinal blockage, and I needed emergency surgery right away. So by the time we figured this out, it was probably 10.30 at night, and the GI surgeon was called in because this was a GI issue, no longer a gynecological issue. And Dr. Fetterschneider probably should have said, good luck, you're in great hands, I'm going to go home now, and I will check on you in the morning. But that's not what he did. He said, I'm going to scrub in, and I'm going to assist in the surgery. I, it makes me very emotional because it felt like my best friend was coming into the OR with me. He was going to see me through this entire experience. He had been through the whole ordeal so far, and he wasn't quitting. So the surgery happened. Um, it was successful. I was now a general surgical patient for the rest of my recovery, and I was there for probably 10 days. And um, intestinal surgery is not fun. It takes a long time to recover, and it's a diet of ice chips for you know a week or so before anything else can happen. Dr. Fetterschneider came to see me. I'm sorry, the Schneid came to see me every single day. He stopped in every day. Um, he wanted to make sure I was doing well. I wasn't his patient anymore, but I was his patient. And uh, he was just remarkable. He made our family feel as though we were in the best possible hands. And so finally one day, it was time for me to graduate from ice chips to Gatorade. Very exciting day. And uh, Dr. Fetterschneider happened to be there, and he said, what is your favorite color of Gatorade? And uh, I said, well, if I had to pick a favorite, I guess it would be red. So off he went, and a little while later, five minutes later, he came back with two bottles of red Gatorade. And he also had with him a tube of chapstick. And he said, you know, I noticed that your lips are very dry and chapped, and I think you could probably use this. Um, I think that says it all. He was just, he was there for us in every possible way. And I will never forget his kindness. None of us will ever forget his kindness. And um, obviously I was beyond childbearing age at this point. And, but had I not been, had I been able to have another baby, and had I had another baby, Schneid would have been the middle name. <laughs> As you have heard, I've had the good fortune to be a nurse at Tufts Medical Center for over 35 years, having the privilege of working in many different roles as staff nurse, nurse manager, supervisor, and adults, and in pediatrics. And I would like to think that over the past 35 years, that in caring for patients and staff, I have shown compassionate care, more so now after the Boston Marathon bombings. On April 19, 2013, our lives changed dramatically. In the early morning hours, my son Richard, Dick, Donahue Jr., sustained a near fatal gunshot wound to his right femoral artery. Suddenly, this nurse mother was on the other side of the bed, on the other side of patient care. On the ride to Mount Auburn Hospital in an MBTA police cruiser, I was frantically trying to learn what had happened and what was going on. The little I learned was hospital talk for things are really bad, and we really can't tell this to you over the phone. And I was begging the staff to please give me information, but they couldn't. Upon arrival to the ER, the atmosphere was truly eerie. It was very quiet, particularly considering the type of trauma that had come into the emergency room. And one knew that the situation was grim. Richard had arrived to the ER in a full cardiac arrest with a massive blood loss and an open gunshot wound to his artery. With 45 minutes of CPR in the field, and in the ER, he was finally stabilized and taken to the OR for surgery that lasted well over six hours. There are many details and memories of the early hours and days, but I want to focus on some genuine acts of random kindness and compassion. When Kim and I arrived to the ER, we were greeted with quiet respect. The Mount Auburn Hospital senior leadership was present, giving us support. A room was designated for us to use and for the rest of the family as everybody raced in to be with us. Many staff members reached out to us. Physicians and nursing staff met with us throughout the course of the next several hours to um, keep us in the loop as to what was going on and debrief us on the situation. This was not an easy task for them and it certainly was not an easy report to get for me as a nurse. As a mother and nurse, I had to stay focused as I knew my family was turning to me 
to interpret the news and assure a young wife and mother that her husband would be okay. It was very clear to me that the staff had worked valiantly to save his life and were just as stunned and shocked as we were. At the time, I could not shake off the need to know if someone had talked to Richard before he went to surgery. To think of a loved one alone was unbearable to me. I asked and I asked and I asked about, and sure enough, a nurse did come up and approach me. Mary, a longtime nurse in the emergency room, shared that she had whispered in his ear, don't screw it up. <laughs> I hugged her and was deeply touched to know that Junior had gone off to the OR with someone rooting for him and someone saying that they loved him. It was, it was to me, an amazing gift. Another vivid memory is the first time I saw Richard Jr. He was in the SICU, tubed, sedated, and on a ventilator. He had an EJ line in his neck, chest tubes and other tubes in his body. He was being mechanically cooled to save his, um, in hopes of sparing his organs, and most particularly his brain, since he had been um, had anoxic injury. My once vibrant boy, my child, lying in a bed, cold to touch, unresponsive, and clearly injured, truly tested my composure. I asked the SICU nurse, being the type A personality that I am, mm -hmm. and um, I, former ICU nurse, if I could do my own assessment of him. I needed to check his neuros signs. I wanted to assess his lung sounds. I needed to check the pulses on his damaged legs. This nurse clearly was confident in her practice and not threatened by my request. This nurse handed over his stethoscope for me to use. This nurse gave me respect and empathy. Acts of kindness and compassion come in the color blue, MBTA blue. From the minute we arrived in the emergency room to this day, our MBTA family has walked the journey with us, whether it was providing rides, offers to take care of the babies, even get diapers. We have been cocooned and protected, given guidance and support. Compassion, too, is for the caretakers. How deeply touched I was one day to learn that my beloved SICU nurses at Tufts Medical Center sent food to the Mount Auburn Hospital SICU staff. These nurses recognize the toll it takes on staff working on a complex trauma patient with the added emotion of the act of violence in our city and in our neighborhood. There are many stories I can tell you, but these anecdotes are truly dear to my heart. I have a bigger family today, the Mount Auburn Hospital community, the MBTA, all the first responders, our FBI victim specialists, and of course, Tufts Medical Center. We paid tribute this past April on the first anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombings. I could not help but think of the coincidence of Easter and Passover occurring at this time. Remembering those that passed and those that survived, and for us rejoicing our son's survival while celebrating the birth of a new grandchild. Reminders that we have much to be grateful for. For Richard Jr. and his family, each day is a recovery day as he continues to work on strengthening his leg, and his objective is to get back to work. For me, I am truly and deeply grateful. I hope that my nursing practice going forward reflects what I've learned this year. Thank you. I began my career as a pediatric nurse at both the Floating Hospital and the Children's Hospital in Boston. And through all of my years as a clinical nurse in those two outstanding organizations, I really learned firsthand that I was caring for the entire family and not just the child. And now as a CEO, I really wanted to ensure the absolute best, most compassionate, family-centered care for all of our communities. So this story paints a picture of two very special pediatric nurses and how they made the difference for one family. My story begins with an expectant mother, Sarah. She was 31 years old, college educated, married, with a seven and three year old uh, daughter from a suburb in the Merrimack Valley. Pregnancy always has its challenges, but for Sarah, carrying a baby was particularly challenging. She had to admit that she was addicted to prescription pain medications and needed to get herself into rehab. Drug addiction also does come with a level of stigma in our society and nurses can be susceptible to that, just like everybody else. So these very special nurses, to get over their own feelings about, uh, negative feelings about addiction, and to better care for these moms, 
actually went on, took it upon themselves to get extra education. They visited methadone clinics to learn about the treatment process and about what these expected mothers are going through. Their education gave them the tools to suspend their own feelings about drug addiction and to let their compassion come through for these patients. Our nurses, Maria and Lisa, met Sarah pre-delivery as a part of the plan for pregnant women who are on drug treatment protocols. They got to know the expected moms and help them to understand the process of caring for themselves as well as the special needs of their babies. They learned about Sarah's strengths, like her full-time job, her stable marriage, and her commitment to do absolutely what was right for her baby. And she also told them about her challenges, her addiction issues, her worries and concerns about having another child, and the fact that the family was really struggling to make ends meet. Spending the extra time with the patient allowed these nurses to learn about Sarah as a person and to get information about her that would help them care for her and the baby over the coming weeks. Sarah's baby boy was born in mid-November, but because he was drug exposed, he needed medication to get him stable in the first days of his life. As soon as he was stabilized in special care nursery, he was moved to a rooming in room with his mom and Maria and Lisa settled Sarah into the baby's room with an adult bed right next to the baby's crib. From this point, the pediatric nursing team became the baby's caregivers and would also become positive role models and parenting coaches and confidants for Sarah. Their goal, to prepare Sarah to be the best mom she could be and help her overcome the challenges she faced as a mom in recovery. It was a very intensive time for this family and for their nurses but is what they needed to position this mother and her family for success. This story is one of success through compassion. These families need our understanding of their challenges and not our judgment. And thanks to the added knowledge that these nurses had, they were able to give these families what they needed. It's immensely satisfying for the nurses because they care for the whole family and give them the tools that they needed for the best chance for success. Maria and Lisa's skill and compassion made all the difference for this very special family. So given the powerful stories that you've heard this evening, I'd really like to turn the tables now and challenge each of us to think hard about what more can every one of us do in our jobs when we go back to our hospitals, our VNAs, our organizations, agencies, whatever they may be. And what can we do to better inspire and to promote compassionate care? What will we incorporate that will help us to lead more effectively? In a survey conducted by the Schwartz Center in 2011, overwhelmingly, patients responded that they value compassionate care. Yet fully half of them said that the care that they received was missing compassion. Fully half. In focus groups across the country, patients said they want to feel comfortable, safe, heard, valued, cared for, and respected by their providers. That doesn't sound like too much to ask. I think we all like that, right? They want to have information provided to them in a way that they understand it. They want to be involved in the decision making around their care. They want their providers to listen to them, for the communication to be real. They don't want to be treated like a diseased body part, but a whole person, a human being. We're all patients at different points in our lives. If we've not been patients with a serious health issue yet, just know it is coming. It is coming, and certainly if you haven't experienced it yourself, you've experienced with family members, loved ones, certainly we have seen in, in patients when they're going through a very difficult time, we see them and care for them in some of the most vulnerable moments in their lives. So how do we do this? We heard certainly from our speakers tonight, from Diane talking about the whole family, from Consuelo, also the broader family, including the work family. It's really about helping to take care of everyone. I reflect on the words uh, that Ken Schwartz said. If I have learned anything, it is that we never know when, how, or whom a serious illness will strike. If and when it does, each one of us wants not simply the best care for our body, but the best care for our whole being.